If you want to master classification, you need to follow those five steps. Today we're going to cover one of the most, uh, I would say, frustrating and boring steps, but probably one of the most important ones, which is pre-processing the data. And actually, machine learning companies devote 90% of their time in this step. So there are several steps that you can take, and in order to be to them make them more memorable, I'm going to give you one step for every day of the week. So step one is trivial, is importing the data. The second step is checking out for missing values. The step three, plotting the data in order to check out for outliers. The step four, encoding the categorical variables. Remember that the strings are not factors. The step five, analyze the continuous variables in order to make them more uh, suitable for the fitting or avoid some spurious uh, correlations between variables. And step number six is check out for class imbalances. And step number seven, is split the data into training and test and if maybe sometimes validation. Okay, so let's skip step number one and jump into step number two. So checking out well, what about missing values. So in some cases, some predictors have no values for a given sample. We're going to call those values generically NA or not available. So take a look at this Titanic data set. As you can see, for instance, passenger number 13 didn't have the age recorded. So we can do a couple of things with this sort of, of NA. So if the, if the data set is large enough, we can remove those samples and, and you know, pay the price of dropping some of the data. That is going to, it's not going to be so relevant. Okay? And sometimes we can do that e even more quietly if we assume that the, the, the data that we are missing is not very informative. So for instance, in the case of the Titanic data set, the age is not very relevant because if you take a look at who survived according to the age, this is not going to make a huge difference. So in this case, I would drop the data. In some other cases, the data set is small, so dropping the data is not a choice because we have to pay a, a steep price in removing the samples. So we have a couple of possibilities. The simplest one is use an algorithm that can handle with an ace, and for instance, classification trees can do that. And the other thing that we can do is try to guess the NAs. For instance, some algorithms like KNN can estimate the missing values. Next step, what if we have outliers? So the best way to detect the outliers is plotting the data. And what is an outlier? Typically, we define an outlier as a sample that are exceptionally far from the mainstream of the data. This is pretty subjective, and, and sometimes we have to make a choice based on experience and not a quantitative criterion. So there are a couple of possibilities to check that. For instance, we can type box plots like this, and as you can see here, the box plot by definition, give us then some, some points that are outside of what is considered mainstream. So in this case, all the, all the outliers are plotted with these circles here. The other possibility is do a scatter plot. For instance, this is a time series. It could be, you know, several months. And of course, if you see something like this, this is telling you something, okay? And there are some other possibilities like using quantile plots, but I'm not going to cover this in, 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 that, in this video. And the second way to detect um, outliers should be trying to fit a model and then according to that model, try to see if some points are outliers, okay? Typically, we can classify outliers in three categories. So the first one is the most, I would say, prosaic one, which is the typo. And by a typo, I mean some a wrongly typed value inside the data set or a badly typed formula. So this is a very famous example in which two Harvard economists made a mistake in one of the formulas and that you know, produce a lot of wrong predictions about the U.S. growth. And, and this was very influential for the Bush administration and was hardly criticized by Paul Krugman in, the, in this article. We could call the second type of outlier simply a sensor error. So this name comes from physics. And, and this is, again, a very famous example. This is called the OPERA experiment in which they tried to measure the velocity of neutrinos. And because of some measurement errors, some outliers that were actually something related to the way in which the data was processed, they conclude that neutrinos could f travel faster than the speed of light. That according to Einstein's law is impossible, but and again, this was um, actually uh, disproved a few years later in, in this Icarus experiment. So don't trust your data if a couple of outliers break the laws of physics. Finally, the last type of outlier is the true informative outlier. So let me tell you a story. So there was once upon a time was a guy called Jon Snow, not this one, but this one, who was a London physician who was studying the birth of cholera in London. So he had the theory that cholera was infectious because there was some 
infectious pathogen in water. Of course, he wasn't talking in, in those terms in those days, but he had the theory that water was the cause of the cholera outbreak. The problem is that not only people in Broad Street had cholera, but in other the neighborhoods. But the interesting thing is that when he interviewed the outliers, so people who had cholera in different neighborhoods, he discovered that people used to live in Broad Street and they get accustomed to that water. So they could even walk few, a few miles per day in order to go to that water pump and go back to their homes. So once that he realized that everybody drinking water from that pump was having cholera, then he realized that cholera was actually infectious because of water. And this is one of the most interesting stories, so you can check, out, check this story in that, in that link. Okay, next step, we need to encode the categorical vari variables properly. So in, in other video we discuss what happens if we have a binary outcome, but what if we have a categorical value with different values? So uh, some of the models are not working, did not, do not work very well when you have categorical variables with different levels. And the best way to deal with this is, for instance, if you have five values like brown, blonde, black, red, and gray, you create four factors that are binary factors and are much mutually exclusive. So instead of just trying to fit one categorical variable with five levels, you fit four categorical variables with our binary. And this is going to solve most of the problems that you're going to find in your fitting. Step number five, what can we deal with continuous variables? So when you have continuous variables, sometimes you have to define a distance. The problem with continuous variables is that distance can be somehow misleading. So you have a sum of this graph that, that I have taken from the Titanic data set in which I have plot the age versus the survive or not survive. So here you can see that depending on the way in which you define the age, these two data points could be closer than these two points. And as I was saying, that could be misleading because maybe, uh, you know, being in this category is more important than having different age. So one way to solve this is what they call standardization. That means that instead of playing with the feature X, we're going to remove the mean of the uh, feature and divide it by the standard deviation. And we're going to do this for every continuous variable. Uh, the gain of doing these transformations is now that all of the variables, all of the features now are going to be distributed around zero and the variance of the, the, of the, of the feature is going to be around one, okay? Another problem with continuous variables has to do with the skewness. So sometimes your distribution is something like this. So you have uh, a few data points here and a lot of data points there on the other way around. So you have to deal with that skewness. And there is an automatic way to do that, which is an amazing algorithm called the Box-Cox transformation that tries to reduce the skewness to zero. And this transformation is basically a kind of mm, polynomial transformation. So you take your variable and you uh, elevate that variable to lambda and lambda could take any value. For instance, if lambda equals two, this is like a square transformation. If lambda equals 0.5, this is the square root. If lambda is minus one, it's like taking the inverse of this parameter. And if uh, lambda is close to zero, you can take the logarithm. So, and the good thing with this method is that you can take a distribution like this that is highly skewed to the left and create something like that, which is, looks pretty much like a Gaussian distribution. Another problem with continuous variables has to do with correlations. So sometimes we have tons of continuous variables and we want to reduce the number of, of features. Why? Because fewer features produce uh, faster, let's say, computations. Uh, and the other thing is that sometimes you have collinearity. Collinearity means that, for instance, if you have something which is dark blue in this correlation diagram or, or dark red here, that means that those parameters are highly correlated. So for instance, here you have this feature and this one that are highly correlated. And the problem with that is that if you include all of the features and you do not correct for these correlations, you're going to have unstable models and misleading explanations because you could be attributing some explanation to this variable and maybe this variable is there because it's something like that. You can do that reduction of dimensionality in a couple of ways, and I'm going to cover extensively the first one, which is called the principal component analysis in another video, but you can do this manually. And here you have a kind of algorithm to do that. I'm going to leave this algorithm for a video playing with some R code, so let's forget about that. Another thing that you can do to improve the, the quality of the fitting is instead of using the features alone, like, like instance in here feature A and feature B, and try to classify according to them, you can add a new feature and something that you have 
created from scratch that is the same feature as before but for instance to the square so in this case we're going to have a nonlinear combination of features and in many cases you're going to improve the quality of your classification and in step number six we're getting there in step number six is what we call class imbalances what if you have some some data set and your label data is somehow not well represented by it all, all the categories so in this case you have let's say two uh, around nine squares and and around 20 cycles so you can forget about that and just plug that into your model but the best way to proceed is some doing something like this so you count down sample so if your data set is huge then you can try to drop some of the blues and and have a data set that in which you have almost 50 50 percent of each feature another thing that you can do is upsample this the orange squares what do I mean by upsample? So I, I, I create duplicates of these squares randomly in order to have almost the same number of squares and cycles. This is very dangerous and of course you have to do this in the training set but never in the validation set. Okay. And number seven is split the data into training, validation and test set but this video is very long already I'm, I'm going to leave that for another video.